So back to physics before we start uh, solving these uh, equations numerically. So the equation that we're going to use to illustrate the various numerical methods is the wave equation. Now, um, just a few words on what to expect in terms of solutions. So, um, we've uh, write the equation again here, which is the second time derivative of p, uh, function of x and t, uh, is equal to c square, phase velocity uh, square, uh, multiplying the second space derivative um, uh, of the pressure, function of x of t, plus a source term also depending on x and t. Now, in there, there, there are two situations where we can actually find uh, um, analytical solutions. So if c is uh, a, a, not a function of x, we can, uh, and actually now we also avoid the source term, so no source term, uh, we have with an initial condition uh, p at t equals 0 equals p0, and also the gradient of p being 0, we can find analytical solutions. We'll derive that uh, later and, and uh, show you the result. The second situation is if the source term s of xt actually is a delta function in x and t. So, uh, as you probably know, that means we will get the impulse response of our partial differential equation in terms of a linear system. We will talk about linear systems again at the end of this week. Uh, also a very important concept in connection uh, to solving partial differential e equations. So, uh, the impulse response uh, is basically the Green's function. So, if we have on the right-hand side a source term in terms of delta functions in x and t, then we can basically replace the p with a capital G, which is the Green's function, uh, the solution to an impulse uh, response. Um, we're not uh, deriving this uh, here, but we will make use of, uh, of these uh, analytical results many times. Why? Because in this situation where we have a homogeneous medium, so the velocity does not depend on space, we actually have analytical solutions to compare our numerical solutions with. And that's very powerful, it's very extremely useful uh, to test whether uh, what you do mathematically, if you develop an algorithm and if you implement it uh, as a computer code, whether you actually have uh, a correct result. We'll also make use of a slightly different form of, uh, of the wave equation. This is the for elastic waves. Um, you see here some strings vibrating. It's basically a description of um, waves on a, on a guitar string, for example. Um, and that's uh, described with uh, the letter u, which is a displacement. In this case, in the y direction, if you propagate in x, let's say this is x, then you have a, a particle motion perpendicular uh, to the propagation direction. That's a transverse, uh, transversely polarized, polarized wave. So the partial differential equation describing this is the second time derivative uh, of u y. Uh, multiplied by rho is equal to the first space derivative with respect to x, multiplying the open brackets mu, which is the shear modulus, which is a function of x, also um, the density is a function of x, multiplying the first uh, space derivative of, of u plus some source term that x, uh, acts in the, in the y direction. Now something interesting happens if you again uh, assume a homogeneous medium, so density and the shear modulus uh, mu does not depend on space, then you can take the mu out of the bracket. If you take rho to the other side of the equation, you get mu divided by rho, and you might know this, the velocity, the shear velocity actually is, uh, uh, let's call this c, uh, is equal to the square root of mu divided by rho. So you end up with an equation, second time derivative um, of, uh, with respect to time of mu is equal to c squared uh, times second time derivative of uh, u plus a source term. And you see, mathematically, that's actually um, identical to the wave equation that we had for, for acoustic waves. So um, uh, on the other hand, uh, when the medium is heterogeneous, this equation is a little more complicated than the acoustic wave equation, as you've seen, because you have this, uh, also have a derivative 
of uh, something multiplying the, the shear modulus and we will get into that uh, later that actually has an impact on the specific uh, solution algorithm. To understand the actual original real partial differential equation but also to understand the um, properties of the numerical algorithms that we develop, we often make use of so-called plane wave descriptions. We've encountered that, this, uh, that, that before, but just uh, w one more word on this. So, uh, a plane wave uh, is characterized by a wave number k, which is basically a vector that points in the, in the direction of propagation, as you, you can see here. So, uh, k is a vector, kx, ky, kz are the components. So, if you think of a pressure, a plane pressure uh, wave, uh, this would be characterized as uh, p is equal to uh, p0, which is an amplitude, multiplying, for example, sine kx, where k is a vector, x is a position vector, minus omega t. Could also be a, a cosine, um, replacing the sine, or a combination of both. Um, we also often make use of the exponential form, in which case um, we would write p equals uh, p0 e to the uh, ikx minus omega t, after i there's an op open bracket of, uh, of course. Again, k is the vector, uh, the wave number vector, x is the position vector. The same applies uh, to the elastic form, in this case for example, um, the description of an elastic um, uh, transverse waves in one dimensions, let's make an example uh, like this, would be uh, uy equal, uh, equal to a0, that would be a, uh, an amplitude um, in the y direction, uh, e to the i kx x minus omega t, and kx then would be the wave number in the x direction. So, and um, all the time here, we have uh, the relation c equals omega divided by k. If it's a vector, then it's actually the modulus of k. Uh, if we have a one-dimensional wave propagation, c equals omega divided by kx, if we propagate in x direction. Our linear wave equation actually has a very interesting property. It's symmetric in time. Now, I would like to illustrate that with an example, what that means. Um, uh, you see here a one-dimensional example of a complicated uh, model. So, uh, it's a, uh, the structural heterogeneity here, that, that's the, the velocity model as a function of space, is very complicated, it's actually random. So, um, let's assume that we have uh, two points, A and B. And uh, we start with uh, injecting a source at A, recording at B, and then we inject a source at B, recording at A. Would you immediately think that uh, this gives exactly the same result? I don't think it's so intuitive, but actually that's the result, the consequence of the fact that the um, wave equation is symmetric in time. So this is a, a numerical example, uh, so you can redo this later once we start uh, developing our own algorithms. So um, it turns out you actually get the same result. Another aspect of this is uh, so-called time reversal. Um, and also, you, you see, uh, in, uh, behind me, you will see a wave field that's propagating out from a source point, and it's actually recorded at a circular array of receivers. Now, um, you can actually uh, take these recordings at each of those receivers in the ring, you flip them around in time and re-inject them as sources at those points, and you can see what happens. Actually, it, it, uh, everything is, um, is propagating back to the source and uh, focuses on the individual source point. To some extent, you can call this reverse acoustics, and actually that's something that's, for example, used in, in medicine um, to focus energy, if, if uh, acoustic energy in, in, in sonic applications. But the mathematical concept of this time reversal reciprocity is actually also extremely important in developing tomography algorithms, meaning recovering the internal structure where you have recorded acoustic wave, for example, um, an oil exploration uh, problem. So, again, these are uh, fundamental concepts of the wave equation that also later it's real fun um, playing around with these, uh, with these things um, using numerical algorithms. 
Let's talk a little more about structural heterogeneities. What I mean by that is basically the, um, the variation of the parameters of the partial differential equation. In our case, this can be the acoustic velocity, basically the, the speed of, uh, uh, of the waves as a function of space, or it could be, in the elastic case, the distribution of uh, density and the shear modulus. Now, here's a graph that shows some examples of, uh, of different types of heterogeneity. If you think of the Earth, this could be a layered model. It could be, uh, for example, a model with internal curved um, interfaces where the material changes abruptly. Or you might be interested in understanding the scattering of a single point where the material parameters are, are changing. There are also different degrees of smoothness of heterogeneity. So, for example, there might be a relatively smooth model of heterogeneities, and in that case, uh, you might actually uh, uh, there might be other more efficient techniques than directly solving the wave equation uh, using numerical methods. And what I'm thinking about this is, for example, ray theory or finite frequency ray theory. And the most general case, and that's given here on the uh, bottom right. Um, this would be uh, basically a medium with arbitrary uh, heterogeneities, uh, random heterogeneities, for example, and there's just no way around using numerical methods. And again, I want to recall, that's probably the reason why you're here, because you want to solve a problem um, where, where there actually is a, a certain degree of uh, structural heterogeneities or the partial differential equation you are going to solve. Um, the parameters are actually varying uh, rapidly in space. There's another concept I would like to explain to you in connection with solutions to the exact equation and our numerical approximation. So, remember we would like to find um, solutions to the wave equation. Let's take the acoustic wave equation and we look for, uh, for pressure as a function of time. We're in a homogeneous medium, and we know for these kind of uh, situations we have actually a Green's function, we have an analytical solution. Now, without showing equations here, I just want to explain the concepts. Actually, the analytical solution to the problem of a delta function is a heaviside function, which is the integral of a delta function. So, actually what you expect, uh, basically, for an impulse at some distance is you know, just simply a step function that's given here. Now, would we ever be able to simulate something like this correctly with a numerical solver? The answer is no. Why? Because the heaviside function or the delta function, as you probably know, contains infinite frequencies. We will never be able to uh, simulate on a computer in the discrete world um, infinite frequency, infinite frequencies. So we'll always have a, a band limited. Uh, solution to the Green's function. Now, um, I would uh, like to show you something interesting that, that happens. What if you have a numerical solver and you inject a, such, a, such a delta function? Um, actually, you can do this, we will see this later. And I just want to show you the results here. So, the result is something like uh, you see here, and it looks weird. It kind of has a step, but then it has a lot of oscillations. That's called numerical dispersion, we understand this later. But does that mean we have to throw the, away this uh, solution, we cannot use this? Use this? The answer is no. Um, actually, um, as you know, there is the so-called uh, convolution theorem that tells us that if you want to um, obtain the solution of a system for an arbitrary source time function, you actually do a convolution of the Green's function with the source time function. And you see this funny symbol um, in, in, in between G and the source time function, which denotes the convolution. Um, there is also, remember, the convolution theorem that tells us if, if this is something that uh, is uh, defined in this a convolution in the time domain, then in the uh, frequency domain, it's a multiplication. Now, what happens if you obtain such a, uh, a, 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 a numerical solution that obviously seems to be wrong? Now, let's assume you would like to know the response of the system to a, 
uh, let's say, the first derivative of a Gaussian, this is our source time function. The analytical solution is simply the convolution of the Green's function with this source time function, and that's what you obtain. It's actually the integral of the first derivative of a Gaussian, so it will uh, be a, a Gaussian function. Now, what happens if you do exactly the same operation and not with the exact Green's function, but with the numerical Green's function, which obviously is, uh, uh, seems to be wrong? Surprise! You actually obtain the correct solution. Because you're filtering out the part of the solution that is incorrect, you still obtain, uh, the, in this case, for these parameters, the correct uh, solution of, of this problem. Now, um, I hope I haven't confused you. That might seem academic, but it actually has a lot of uh, potential applications. Because that means, if, for example, if you want to understand wave propagation in a very strongly heterogeneous, uh, maybe a random medium, you can actually inject a kind of a, a, a delta function in your numerical algorithm. You get a, um, a basically completely wrong numerical solution, but you can filter it later if you make sure that your, your algorithm is, uh, is uh, correctly modeling the frequency domain of your source wavelet, you will actually obtain the correct result. So that's a consequence of the fact that um, not only the uh, partial differential equation itself, but also our numerical solution is actually can be treated as a linear system with all the consequences concerning Green's functions, um, and convolution with uh, potential uh, source time functions. So, a very powerful concept.